The first work details start felling the trees to make way for the rocket pioneer's new mecca. Months later, massive concrete buildings rise out of the Baltic sand. Factories where rockets will roll off the production line. Testing stations, laboratories, a wind tunnel. Everything a high-tech armorer might require. Pinamunda, a place of destiny for Germany. In 1937, the tiny fishing village mutates into the biggest expertise factory in the world. More than 4,000 technicians, engineers and scientists a day stream into the military facility, where attention is feverishly focused on developing new weapons. The technical director of the center, the ruler of the roost, is 25-year-old Werner von Braun. We saw this young man sitting there, very much at ease, very casual, very athletic. It was astonishing that he should be the technical director of a huge facility like that. Intellectually, Werner von Braun struck me as a very competent man. His upbringing may well have been a, an advantage. A small test rocket floats down from the sky. Pictures from the early days. Still no sign of priority rating or military hardware. But even the dynamic young von Braun knows that the center's primary purpose is to develop weapons. Not a place for innocent idealists or naive rocket fanatics. No money will be spent here on moonshots. There was something Faustian about it all. It all started in the late 1930s. He was born in 1912, so he was still in his mid-twenties when someone came along and said, here's an unlimited budget, get on with it. A tempting proposition for a 25-year-old, especially at a time when it's far from obvious that he's making a pact with the devil, the ultimate evil. Noch gar nicht offensichtlich ist, dass man sich wirklich mit dem Teufel eingelassen hat, mit dem Gipfel des Bösen. Hitler is skeptical about the Pinamunda Group. Nevertheless, he agrees to attend the occasional test flight. Group portrait with Hitler, taken in 1939 on a visit to the Kummersdorf site. Before a test, Werner von Braun would briefly explain what it signified and how far the technology had progressed. Then the trial would get underway. Von Braun loves demonstrating the noise and power of his engines, but the show is a flop. Hitler was standing in front of me, so I was able to observe him, and he wasn't impressed at all. Then came the next crucial question, addressed to von Braun and Dornberger. How long did they reckon the development work would take? At least five to ten years, they told him. Whereupon Hitler turned to his people and said, that's too long. Six months after the flying visit to von Braun's facility, Hitler gives the order to invade Poland. The Second World War begins. Hitler's Blitzkrieg tanks defeat the Polish forces within days. There's still no need for von Braun's new rocket missiles. Still 1939, winter in Peenemünde. The uniformed staff of the military test facility and their civilian technical director still seem able to pursue lines of peaceful inquiry. Von Braun in trilby and leather coat. The only time the rocket baron gets physically involved is when it comes to picking up the pieces of a test rocket. Werner von Braun and his group at the Peenemünde Rocket Center are still left to go about their pioneering work undisturbed. Tests are diligently carried out on the small A5 rocket, gradually building up the scientists' knowledge of the new missile technology. The real object of desire, the V2, is still a long way from the flight testing stage. It can be admired only as a model in the wind tunnel. In 1940, flight testing finally starts on the big new rocket. 
The V2 dwarfs everything that's gone before. 14 meters high and 13 tons in weight. With 50,000 components, it's a miracle of engineering. Or will be if it works. One failed launch follows another. Von Braun has known from the outset how difficult it will be to get the highly complex V2, or Aggregat 4, as it's known at this stage, off the ground. By now, he is fueling the arguments of the skeptics more than he thought. When a rocket was launched, started to wobble, and even somersaulted in the air, we all thought, uh-oh, we're goners. Because when something like that drops out of the sky and crashes to the ground with a great bang, it's hard to tell where you are safe. I thought on several occasions that I didn't envy anyone in that job. Werner was always an optimist, always saw positives, even in tests that failed. He learned from them and used the knowledge to build better rockets next time. By the time a V-2 is towed to the launch pad on the 3rd of October 1942, the pressure to succeed has increased enormously. The war is going badly for Hitler's armies. And every attempt to launch the new weapons so far has failed. The usual launch preparations, priming the gyro control system and filling the fuel tank. Von Braun, in the leather coat and hat he now always wears on occasions like this, looking confident and relaxed. Emblazoned on the rocket, the woman in the moon is a pin-up girl, a mascot with a dash of male fantasy. Fifteen fifty-eight. The countdown begins. The launch is a success. Three years after Hitler's visit, the rocket lands 180 kilometers away and reaches a height of 90 kilometers. It was the very first man-made projectile in space. He was proud, and he made no attempt to hide it. I could see it in his face. No more wondering whether or not it would end in a mid-air explosion. From that day onwards, he looked a different man. But despite the historic test in October, the V-2 remains a temperamental, unpredictable rocket. Von Braun's baby, as he calls it, simply cannot get the hang of flying. His employees expect him to deliver a serviceable weapon. More than ever in 1943. In January, the war on the Eastern Front enters a crucial phase when the 6th Army suffers a crushing defeat at Stalingrad. The tide of war finally seems to have turned against Hitler. Only a miracle can help him now, or a wonder weapon. Five months after Stalingrad, von Braun flies his service plane to the Wolfschanze, the Führer's military headquarters.